All right, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Got a nice big crowd over here. Really excited about that. Um, so today we're going to be talking to you about the automation of data collection for uh, you know business analytics, specifically in the robotics context. And um, just to give you a little bit of information about myself, uh, my name is Abraham Dawahe. I am the head of solutions at Foreman, and I've been working uh, at the intersection of hardware and software for a very long time. And I've had a lifelong passion for robotics. That's me as a kid at a robotics competition, uh, maybe 20 years ago. Um, so sort of in my blood. So we're going to tell you a root causing story. Uh, you know, we're going to we can't really share our customer data with you, but you know, we've done something very special here. We built a simulation of a warehouse, and we're going to tell you a story of how we see our customers and how we see you know the right way to actually root cause a problem, solve it, deploy it, and verify it. So we have this fake company called Bots and Boxes, where we sell and ship uh, fuses and sprockets to components absolutely essential for robotics. And every warehouse has three AGVs, you know, very classic type AGV. You see a bunch of them here at the conference. A couple of robot arms and a couple of human operators that introduce some level of uh, uh, some level of entropy into the system. Now we have taken this fairly seriously. You know, we have directly instrumented the physics and the game engine to provide us some real instrumentation and some real data that we can then take, analyze, and derive results from. You know, what, a couple of examples of that are modeling things like battery drain based on AGV load, you know, measuring the weight of the pallet that's on the AGV and how that directly impacts the actual battery. You know, things that make this feel, you know, like a real world application. And we've gone ahead and deployed this to 10 global warehouse sites. Now, <laughs> we're running this in uh, the cloud, and <laughs> my CEO is over there, and he's probably angry with me that I'm running this on 10 P2 instances that cost uh, quite a bit of money per hour to run. But we do this so that we can actually take camera images from all of the game simulations, have real data, and actually you know, enjoy this and actually be able to show you something that does make sense. So we've also done you know, some work around building out analytics dashboards, KPIs, things that we think in the warehouse industry would be very important for someone to track. So here's our story. You know, we're gonna start with an automated alert that's going to inform a KPI that we wanna take a look at. And then when we're looking at that KPI, we're actually gonna time travel back to the point in time where that alert was generated and try and investigate the problem. After we have investigated this problem, we're then gonna you know, take whatever action we need to take, maybe it's a configuration change, software update, whatever it may be, deploy that, and then verify that that's actually fixed the problem. So in our warehouse scenario, you know, one of our most important things is the time it takes for an AGV to take an order from inventory to shipping. You know, we define that as order dot duration. And in our warehouse, in our simulation, we know that any order that takes longer than 60 seconds, one minute to deliver is a problem and it's something that we should be looking at. So, you know, we're big users of Slack at Foreman, and, you know, one of the things that we've done is we've hooked up Slack to our, you know, game simulation, and this alert came in, order duration exceeded limit. You know, we can see from the tag set that it's from Sacramento, it's running version 1.0.0, which is sort of interesting, and it was an order for an 18.2 sprocket and 120 amp fuse. Um, very common order, something that we see a lot in our, you know, bots and boxes. Now, okay, I get this in the morning, maybe. I open up my analytics dashboard and I'm looking at this and I say, well, hold on a second, what's going on here? These two things are sort of interesting. Why in Sacramento, which is that big purple line at the top, why is it taking so many trips to the charger? And I can see here in my order duration anomalies KBI that I'm hitting a number you know, above 60 quite often. And one interesting thing here too is actually PDX um, actually went down over the last sort of day and a half. So that one's actually fine, but Sacramento has sort of seen an increase in duration anomalies. So at this point in time, you know, we're going to say, okay, let's take a look at this and jump in our time machine. We're going to click on that data point and go back in time to when that alert was generated. And when we get here, we'll start seeing some interesting things. You know, some of the things that we see are you know, the AGV velocity over here, it's running at about, you know, six tenths of a meter per second. That's not right. Uh, I think we're supposed to be running closer to, you know, 2.4. We can also see that our safety, our limit is at one, which is also incorrect. Um, so we start seeing, you know, there's not something quite right here. 
you know, maybe we need to talk to our operations team and figure out what's going on. You know, we can clearly see from the video that the guy, he's just absolutely crawling through the warehouse, and that's a huge problem. So we talk to our ops team. They get on the application configuration, and they say, oh, yeah, you know, we forgot to update the configuration. We'll go ahead and do that. We'll reset the AGV safety limit, and we'll bump the NAV version to 1.0.1. We make that change and we deploy that to the fleet. So we use our command line tooling, update it, watch it, you know, watch its update in progress, which is what the right side of the screen is, you know, watching which version of configuration is applied versus which one is desired, making sure that this is actually update, updates it actually takes and it looks like what we expect. And then, you know, we can go back and we can, you know, look at this in live mode and see that hey, we can actually see here that our AGV velocity went from the limit of one to the limit of three. Its actual velocity, which is this blue line over here, looks correct. And we can complete, we can really tell from the video that in real time, the AGV's parameters were changed and it actually did not require an AGV restart. It didn't require, you know, shutting down the warehouse and it didn't require anything crazy. It just starts going. So, you know, that's our root causing story. That's something that we see Quite often, actually, when we talk to a lot of companies is they end up spending a lot of time trying to figure out what the problem is instead of actually fixing the problem. And it's something that, you know, we think can be made very simple with a cloud native approach to some of these problems. So a uh, quick note about Formit. Uh, sales guys would be very angry if I didn't talk to you about the company. Um, you know, we're trying to empower the next generation of automation. Uh, you know, we take data from robots, from PLCs, cameras. You know, any kind of input source data and make it available for developers, executives, operators, you know, reading data from the physical world, writing data to the physical world, and making that very accessible to everybody. And we kind of think about this in three different ways. So first is observability, tackling the unknown unknowns. Now, you know, what's the difference between a known known and unknown unknown? Well, you know, a known known is something like, you know, I got an if check in my code, I catch an exception, I can generate an alert from that. You know, it's a lot more difficult when your robot drives into a corner and you have no idea why that happened. You need the context of all of the data around that to understand that problem and derive insights from it. The operation aspect of your you know, robotic fleet. You know, when you start out, you maybe have one or two robots, one engineer to a robot. But as you start scaling your operation, you really want to flip that ratio. You, know, you want one operator for 10 robots, one operator for 100 robots, doing things like interventions, teleoperation, you know, not needing SSH root access to your robot just to unst unstick it from a corner, uh, which is something that we see quite often. And then lastly, analytics. You know, uh, something that's very interesting that we're seeing with a lot of our customers is that they don't tell their customers that they're a robotics company, they're a construction company, or they're a logistics company, you know, they're a dog training company. Um, robotics is just the tool that they use to solve that problem. Now, <laughs> one thing that we know from you know, my experience in SaaS and other types of industries is that you want to be data driven. Your customers want to see ROI with real data. They don't want to see, you know, intuition or things like that. They want real data driven analytics that just happen to come from a robot. So let's dive into observability a little bit more here. You know, really important with observability is the ability to go directly from your sensor to a visualization and observe it, right? Now, a lot of native server cloud logging tools, they're gonna to deal with text numeric type data, but that's not really robot-shaped data. Robot-shaped data is images, it's point clouds, it's indoor localization, it's GPS. It's these types of data that are, in some cases, very heavy, but also require you know, a specific type of visualization to understand. It's also about having a time machine, you know, being able to hop in the door and go back to when that alert happened and understanding the concept the context of that situation. You know, I just showed you the warehouse uh, example, and it's very easy for us to jump from an alert to a point in time that that happened and understand the context of the whole warehouse in that situation. You know, leveraging an aspect of dimensionality. So, you know, one of the things that we believe in is sort of having this unstructured tag set that you define depending on your robotic application, and then being able to drill down into very specific tags, you know, specifically. So in this example, we're drilling down into uh, a location in uh, South Florida, which is actually where my mom's house is, and also in the Dominican Republic, which is uh, where my family's from. But then filtering down to that very specific data is something that's super important and needs to be easy. 
And you know, not all input sources are robots. So I'm gonna go with a live demo here, so hopefully this works. You know, one thing that we see a lot is, you know, your robots have cameras, they have tools, they have utilities, but you might have an operator that's like, hey, I don't know what's going on with the robot, something's broken here, you know, what's going on? Hopefully this works. And you know, so there's you guys. Um, you wanna be able to record in real time kind of what's happening, maybe add some annotations to it, and have input sources that are not just your robot. Moving on to sort of the operational section, you know, we, we think about this in a couple of different ways. So first one is doing, you know, kind of an intervention style request. You know, this is an example of a computer vision uh, sort of workflow where maybe your robot is taking pictures of pizzas and you want to count the number of pepperonis on that pizza. So, you know, you're going to select the pepperoni, you're going to put a circle around it or a box, maybe you add some labels, and then off it goes. Now, a really important part of this is that it's a human in the loop with your robot. It's not you know, uh, it's not your robot talking to a backend server that then takes, you know, 25 minutes to get to some other system. It's really synchronous in some cases or asynchronous if you want, but it's human in the loop with your robot, robot talking to human. You know, speak robot is our sort of marketing uh, lingo. Being able to configure and deploy your entire fleet. You know, we've taken a very cloud native approach to this. We treat your robot configurations infrastructure as code, which is a very important concept in cloud terminology. And being able to deploy and maintain your configuration software version control or other you know, similar systems is really key to understanding you know, what state is your robot fleet in. And at the same time, you know, this is not something that talks maybe directly to your robot. There are cases where that is important, but you know, maintain the state in a cloud backend that your robot can then ask for when it comes back online. One of the things that we all know is that network reliability is super difficult in a robotics context. And you know, we've taken this sort of into account in the way that we think about a lot of these things. Being able to beam in and tell the op your robot. You know, <laughs> uh, I don't know how many people here have had the sort of drunk robot experience where the robot is driving, you know, in a zigzag line down the hallway. But you know, if your robot gets stuck in a corner or it gets stuck behind a person or someone knocks it over, or well, hopefully nobody knocks it over. But you had some it's occasionally you need to actually beam in and take direct control of the robot, fix it and go. Now, a lot of the tooling that we see is really sort of engineer-specific tooling. You know, it's not an operator-specific tooling. And a lot of the sort of workflows we see are, okay, I'm going to SSH to the robot, I'm going to open up a uh, ROS tool, and maybe send some command bell, you know, to the robot itself directly. Um, you know, it doesn't really work for an operator. It doesn't work if you have a call center, you know, something like that. And lastly, analytics. You know, remembering again, you know, we want to we want to empower our customers. And we want to talk about being data driven, and being a data driven company that maybe happens to use robotics to solve this particular problem. So going directly from the robot sensor to a business insight, you know, automatically, not building tools that take this data, parse it to that data, and go to that data, but going directly from robot sensor to business insight. And all of these actual KPIs are derived directly from that uh, Unity warehouse box and boxes simulation I was showing you. So, you know, we actually have some, <laughs> some really interesting ones here and, you know, some anecdotes around this, but when I first built it, I didn't actually know what I was going to show as the root causing journey. I kind of let the game sort of run for a couple of days and I started to notice things, um, especially around uh, order duration. So I sort of zeroed in on that and I modeled it around that, but I wouldn't have been able to do that without something like this. And the last piece is, you know, trying to be flexible around the different tools that you do integrate with. So, you know, we think of ourselves as sort of a data pipe in a lot of cases. How do we, we're really good at getting robot from your, da from your data from your robot to the cloud, right? So whether you're a ROS application, you know, whether you have uh, log files on your file system, or you just want to use our API to generate dynamic telemetry streams. All of that is part of our architecture and part of our platform. You know, we also know that a lot of people want to use the right tool for the right job. So we use, for example, Slack and PagerDuty for our own backend monitoring and alerting. Um, and we know that people will want to use those as well. You know, another really interesting one that we've got now that uh, we're really excited about is actually an S3 export utility. So, you know, going from, for example, a ROS message to a data type, a JSON data type that is parsable by BI tools. Um, that's one that we're, you know, testing on now with a couple of customers. And so why do we build this? You know, why do we think this is important? You know, 
observability is really tough. Uh, building this platform is not the easiest thing. You know, we typically see that a company will start, they'll hire a full stack engineer, they'll have to start, you know, picking a public cloud, you know, you choose AWS, GCP, Azure, they start looking at the products that they offer. You know, RoboMaker is great, it does a lot of really cool things. Um, but you still want to, you know, start pushing logs and metrics to the cloud. Maybe you need to build a GUI to understand, you know, what's going on. You start now needing to expose data to different stakeholders. You know, you maybe need to hire a second cloud engineer to support that. You start having scalability issues. You know, security starts becoming a concern. You might have to do security audits. You might need to not deploy your VPN where your VPN is not allowed. So, you know, it's a really complex problem. And, you know, we've, we've seen companies devote 20, 30% of their engineering budget to this particular problem. All right. Thank you.